Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Niv Dayan, who's a postdoc at uh, Harvard University. He works with uh, Stratos Idrios um, in the data systems lab. And uh, before he uh, came to Harvard, uh, Niv got his PhD from the University of Copenhagen, and he has worked on um, on storage subsystems, in particular, how do you build flash trans translation layers um, um, you know, to optimize them. So that's his background. Uh, so he'll be here with us today. So he'll give the talk, and then he's meeting with a bunch of us. If you're still interested in meeting with him, just let me know. Uh, uh, there's still a couple of slots left uh, for later in the afternoon if you are available. Okay, with that, Niv, go ahead. All right, thanks a lot. So. Thanks so much for coming by. Uh, so um, yeah, so the title of the talk is Scaling Log-Structured uh, Key Value Stores. And I'm going to present uh, three papers that we've had from the past uh, three SIGMODs uh, about this topic. OK, so, so here we go. So over the past 15 years or so, uh, key value stores, um, the usage of them has exploded for a wide number of applications. So today they're, today they're being used from the cloud to embedded applications on your phone to just uh, an algorithmic block for various larger applications. OK, so why did this need for key value stores arise? The need for that is primarily to be able to ingest application writes more quickly. Right? So the amount of application writes in many workloads is increasing. We're ingesting more writes more quickly. So we need to optimize for that somehow. And to understand how key value stores allow us to uh, improve on the way that existing systems do it, we need to take a quick look at the memory hierarchy. Right? So we have memory devices and storage devices. Right? Memory is expensive, storage is slow, mem uh, and memory is fast. Um, and memory is expensive, and storage is, is more cheap. Right? Now, in addition to that, memory devices are byte addressable, whereas storage devices are block addressable. So with respect to ingesting application writes, what that means is, suppose that I have a small application entry that I want to persist to storage. Um, if I'm to... So the way that this has traditionally been handled in database systems is we would map that application right to a particular block in our database. We would put that entry on that block and persist that to storage. The problem here is that that can potentially require us to do uh, orders of magnitude more work, more physical work, than the logical amount of data that our application needs to write. So, um, uh, and this is, this is in particular what B-trees do, and this is why B-trees can't ingest uh, data too quickly. Right? So a better approach to allow us to ingest application writes more quickly is to, um, to use log-structured writes. And the key idea here is we're just going to batch a bunch of application writes as they arrive. We're going to map them onto a block in storage, put all of the new writes on that block, and persist that to storage. Right? So now we're doing a lot more logical work for every physical unit of work that our storage device does. So that, al that allows us to ingest writes more quickly. And that's, uh, that's essentially what log-structured key-value stores do in their heart. And that allows, us to, allows them to achieve fast writes. Now, in addition to just fast writes, we also want to be able to achieve fast reads. And we want to be able to scale to massive data sizes. But what we observe is that as the data size increases for many existing key-value stores, the performance of both reads and writes degrades. So in this presentation, we'll mainly cover why that is, why that scalability issue exists, and what can we do about making key value stores scale better. OK, so I'll start off by introducing the main data structure used by modern persistent key value stores, and that's the log structured merge tree, or LSM tree. OK, so LSM tree buffers application writes in main memory. Whenever the buffer fills up, we sort its contents and we flush it as a sorted array into secondary storage. All right, so that can continue happening. Every time the buffer flushes, we can flush it to storage. But that creates problems for reads. Right? So we don't want to accumulate too many of these arrays in storage, because for reads, we have to search them. So to cope with that, uh, LSM tree sort merges similarly sized runs. And it organizes them into levels of exponentially increasing capacities. Right? So every time we're merging two runs of approximately the same size, we create a new run that's approximately twice as big. So that leads to runs of exponentially increasing sizes. In order to be able to do a lookup, 
Um, the simplest approach is just to do a binary search across all the different runs in storage. But that can be an issue for reads. That will require us to do a lot of um, IOs to storage for each read. So modern systems actually use um, arrays of fence pointers in main memory, which contain uh, the min-max key in each block of every run. So that basically allows us to do the binary search in memory and thereby only issue one I.O. to each one of the runs in storage. In addition to the fence pointers, uh, modern systems also typically have a set of bloom filters, one bloom filter for each run, and they allow point lookups to skip accessing runs that don't contain uh, the key that you're looking for. Right, so these can return a true negative, which is perfect for performance because you're skipping an I.O. that's not doing any useful work. They can return a false positive, which is a performance waste. You're accessing storage and not finding anything useful. Or they can return a true positive, in which case you find the target key and your lookup terminates. All right, a really critical aspect in the design of these systems is the merge frequency. So basically, which runs do we choose to merge with each other and how greedily we want to do that. And that controls a, an important read-write trade-off. Right? So the more greedy we want merging to be, um, the higher the cost of writes is going to be, because we're going to be, on average, merging each entry more times. But the more greedy merging is going to be, that's also going to give us better reads, because reads will have fewer runs in the system to have to access. OK, so overall, uh, existing systems in industry uh, use broadly two classes of designs uh, to strike that read-write trade-off through merging. And these are called tiering and leveling. So tiering is more write-optimized. It's used by default in Cassandra. And leveling is more read-optimized, and is used by default in, say, RocksDB. And the way they work is roughly as follows. So with a tiered, level, with a tiered LSM entry, each level just gathers runs from the previous level. Only when it reaches capacity, it merges these runs, and then it flushes the resulting run to the next level. On the other hand, with a leveled LS entry, a merge operation occurs at a level as soon as a new run comes in from the previous level. So a new run comes in, you're doing a merge operation. That restricts the overall number of runs at each level to just one. And then if the size of the resulting run now exceeds the size of the level, we flush that on to the next level. OK, so now overall, the number of levels that we have in the LS entry, because of the exponential growth of the levels, is log of n, where the base of that log is r, which we call the, the size ratio between the levels. OK, so based on this r, we can infer the number of uh, runs that exist with a tier design, right? So with tier designs, we can have at most r runs in each one of the levels. Um, whereas with the level design, we can have at most one run per level, because we're merging as soon as a new run comes in. And the size ratio controls an important trade-off. So in particular, when we set the size ratio to be very small, in particular, suppose we set it to 2, in that case, the performance and behaviors of tiered and leveled LS entries actually converge. And, or, yeah. and the reason for that is because when, when the size ratio is small, each level can have at most run, one, one run while being in a stable state. As soon as the next run, run comes in, you're already at capacity. So, so behave, the behavior is just the same. On the other hand, suppose we set the size ratio to be really large. In fact, so large that the first level actually never runs out of capacity. At that point, a tiered LS entry just degenerates into a log because you're never doing any merging at level one, whereas the leveled LS entry degenerates into a sorted array because whenever the buffer flushes, you merge it with the single array that's already at level one. OK. So now we can actually take all that design space and map it into a trade-off continuum where at the extremes we have the log and the sorted array. And here we're measuring read cost against writes. At the center, uh, where the tiered and level designs converge, we have that point I mentioned where the size ratio is set to be 2. And then as you increase the size ratio with either tiered or level designs, that allows you to navigate that trade-off continuum. Now when you reach all the way to the extremes, you get to the log and the sorted array. So essentially, all existing key value stores out there, uh, you can say, inhabit points along the space. And they can also be tuned to navigate that space by adopting the size ratio and tuning it. Now, the key problem is that as the data size increases, this curve gets pushed upwards. 
right? So that leaves us with fundamentally worse read-write trade-offs to be able to strike. So the key question is, are there better and more scalable trade-off curves that move outwards more slowly with the data so that we can maintain more robust performance as data sizes grow? And essentially, the three papers that I'm going to present um, essentially enable increasingly better and more scalable trade-off curves. So I'm going to present them one by one. And we'll start with Monkey. OK, so Monkey stands for Optimal Navigable Key Value Store. And with Monkey, uh, and it's also joint work with Manos Atanasolis, who was a postdoc at my lab at the time, is now a professor at BU, and with Stratus Idros, my advisor. So with Monkey, we looked at how to tune the Bloom filters for LSM tree. So in existing designs, we noticed, uh, existing designs set the false positive rate and the, the number of bits per entry to be the same across all the Bloom filters for the LSM tree. So let's say all of them ha each one of them has x bits per entry for any level. That means that the size of each Bloom filter is proportional to the size of the run that it corresponds to. Okay, now with respect to the number of bits per entry for each Bloom filter, uh, we know how to figure out what the false positive rate is going to be. Uh, the false positive rate for a Bloom filter is approximately e to the power of minus um, the number of bits per entry that you have. So I'm just sort of capturing out like that for simplicity. Okay, and now with respect to the false positive rates across all the, the different Bloom filters, you can you can add them up, and that tells you what is the overall expected number of false positives that you're going to have per point lookup. Right? So each false positive leads to one I.O. Right? So the probability of having to do an, um, an I.O. due to a false positive is equal to that Bloom filter's false positive. So overall, the sum of false positive rates across all the Bloom filters gives us the expected average number of I.O.s that we have to do per point lookup. And here I'm measuring actually um, only sort of useless IOs that don't actually find the target entry. So if you wanted that to be a point lookup to an, an entry that actually exists, you would just have to add one to that expression. OK, so it turns out that that's not the best bound that we can get for point reads. So the key intuition for that is that most of the main memory that we have with these designs is at the largest Bloom filter, right? Because the largest level is exponentially larger than the rest of the levels, and the number of bits per entry is the same across all of them. Now, most of the main memory in our system, in this case, is helping us to save at most one I.O. Right? So the reason to be suspicious here is that most of the main memory in our system here is helping us to save at most a small fraction of the cost of point reads. So the key thing that we can do is it could make sense to take a small amount of main memory from the largest Bloom filter and to reallocate that to the filters at smaller levels. Now. Even if you take as little as one bit per entry from the largest level's Bloom filter and reallocate that to smaller levels, that's going to allow you to, because smaller levels have exponentially fewer entries. So one bit per entry from the largest level can help to, to increase the number of bits per entry at smaller levels by you know, multiple bits, right? Because you just have fewer entries. Now, the false positive rate for a Bloom filter decreases exponentially with respect to the number of bits per entry, which means that for a small and modest increase in the false positive rate at the largest level, we can get an exponential decrease in the false positive rates at all other levels. Right? So in some sense, we're going to lead to an increase in the, in the false positive rate at the largest level, but the decrease in the false positive rates at all the other levels is more than going to offset that with respect to the overall sum of false positive rates. OK, so the key idea is with the same main memory, we can get fewer false positives and therefore fewer IOs. OK, so how do we actually solve about this problem to figure out how to optimally allocate false positive rates to the different levels? So first of all, we relax the false positive rates for the different levels and let them just be variables for, that can, be, can take anything from 0 to 1. Then we can actually model read cost and memory with respect to these false positive rates. So here are. Sort of the cost equations, the math is not so important, but you can sort of see that um, the point read cost is just equal to the sum of the false positive rates across the different levels on average. And you know, we can also model the memory. And here I'm just applying the memory equation for a Bloom filter with respect to the capacity at each level and the false positive rate at each level. Right? So the point is we can model these things quite precisely in the worst case. 
And then we can optimize these equations with respect to each other. So this becomes a, yep? Um, so I'm wondering, is the read cost uh, the same for different levels? Because it seems like each, have, like, each level has a different amount of data. Mm -hmm. Once you check on um, the data is in that level, do you need to scan or do you need to like either research on that level? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's, that's an important question. Um, so. So here I'm looking at point reads. So for point reads, um, you know, the target entry is only on a single block within each run. And then in addition, uh, with modern designs, there are these arrays of fence pointers that allow us to know which precise block within the run contains a target key range. So that means that for every single run, we have to do at most one IO for a point read. Um, I'm going to get to range reads actually later on in the talk. OK. Mm -hmm. Are you assuming that uh, all keys are equally likely to be accessed? Um, yeah, for now, yes. For now, yes, because we're interested. So the goal of this optimization is to improve worst case behavior. I think that uh, there are, that's the main contribution of this work. I think that on top of this, there are probably a lot more opportunities to exploit various workload idiosyncrasies like skew. But this would be work that would come on top. Mm -hmm. Large is the memory footprint of the Bloom filters as compared to the other uh, structures that you have, like the min-max uh, ranges and things like yeah, that? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so the Bloom filters do take up a lot of space. But how much space relative to the other structures actually depends. So in particular, mm -hmm. in some sense, the smaller the entries are going to be, the more space relative to other things the Bloom filters will take up, right? Because with the Bloom filters, like the size of the Bloom filter is independent of the size of entries. It just depends on the number of entries that you have. So like the smaller entries you, that you have for a given data size, the more the Bloom filters will take up relative to the fence pointers. Because the, the, for the fence pointers, the memory or, you know, the, their size is actually proportional to keys. So it can depend, it can somehow depend on the data. Um, I would say that when you have a lot of small entries, it can be I mean, it is essentially the memory bottleneck. When you have situations where you, know, you have very large entries with very, with very large keys, then in that case, the Bloom filters might not necessarily be the memory bottleneck. And in that case, there's future work to be done on how to optimize defense pointers. Yeah. OK. So this essentially becomes a constrained multivariate optimization problem that we can solve using standard techniques. So we use uh, Lagrange multipliers to do that. Um, and that gives us essentially the result of how, how, what is the optimal way of allocating the false positive rates to Bloom filters at different levels so that we essentially minimize uh, point read cost, minimize the sum of the false positive rates given a, you know, for a particular given memory budget. Right? And again, the intuition for why we want to set lower false positive rates to smaller levels is that each level's contribution to point read cost is, you know, in the worst case, the same, 1IO. But it's much, much, much cheaper for us to achieve lower false positive rates at smaller levels because they contain exponentially fewer entries. Now, um, OK, so can we reason about what, um, what kind of performance properties that allows us to achieve? So again, so we can take, by summing up these false positive rates, we can observe that they actually form a geometric progression because they're decreasing exponentially. And you know, a geometric progression converges. And so essentially, the sum of false positive rates um, becomes independent of the number of elements in the series, which is the number of levels. Right? So that makes point lookups become independent of the number of levels in the LSM tree. And that allows you to shave a log factor from point read cost. Okay? So, so that gives us better scalability. Um, yeah. OK, so what this says is that with existing designs out there, um, with existing designs, say RocksDB, if your, data, if your data size is increasing, and at the same time, you're increasing the amount of main memory that you have in the system in proportion to the amount of data, point read costs will still degrade at the logarithmic rate. With this new optimization, as the data size increases and you're scaling memory in proportion to the data size, point read cost will stay stable. That's essentially what this says. OK, and we implemented this on top of RocksDB as well to verify these results. And that's, that's approximately what the curve looks like. OK, so that's monkey. So now I'm going to move onwards. I'm happy to take any more questions, if there are any. Was monkey a standalone implementation, or was it done on 
like modifying RocksDB? Or... Yeah, uh, we modified RocksDB to be able to do it. So uh, RocksDB, I mean, in some sense, it was a very simple augmentation. We just had to make sure that the Bloom filters component of RocksDB knows which level it's assigning a false positive for. And based on that information, it can then do the optimization. data that you were looking at, how many levels, what were R? Like, uh... In the experiment, or? Um, so actually, that point where the two curves converge is the point where you only have one level. Right At that point, there is no difference between uh, monkey and the state of the art. Um, as the number of levels increases, I mean, I think, I think we basically increase it by one level for each one of these points. So I think you have approximately 10 levels over there at the end. All right. So the next one is uh, Dostoevsky. So that builds on top of Monkey. But to, uh, to understand the context for Dostoevsky, I'm going to start off by doing a problem analysis on the leveled merge policy in existing LSM entry designs. So what I'm going to do is an I.O. breakdown of where the different I.O. costs arise for different types of operations in the LSM entry. And then we're going to spot some sort of design problem and see how we can tackle it. OK, so for point rates, we saw that the optimal way of assigning false positive rates is for them to be exponentially decreasing for smaller levels. That also implies that most of the cost of point rates uh, emanates from the largest level. And the reason is that the largest level has the highest false positive rate. So it's, it's exponentially most probable that you'll have false positives to that level. OK, for long range rates, it's uh, sort of the same. So for any target key range that you're going to have, um, the largest level is likely to contain exponentially more entries within that key range because it's the largest level and it's exponentially larger. Right? So for long range reads as well, um, the largest level, the scan at the largest level dominates the overall scan cost. For short range lookups, um, you know, for them we actually have to do a single I.O. To every, to every run. Right? So in that case, our I.O. cost uh, emanates equally from across all levels, and it's equal to the number of levels, so log of n. Okay, and for writes, so writes are quite interesting. So in some sense, um, okay, so merging runs at larger levels is exponentially more expensive because they're exponentially larger, right? But on the other hand, these merge operations take place exponentially less frequently. So overall, these two things balance each other out. And so in the long run, the amount of merge operations that you have to do per level on average, is, is equal, right? So can we reason about this cost? Can we measure it? OK, so to do that, we can you know, suppose the level starts off, off as empty, and then count the number of merge operations that take place in that level until it fills up and becomes empty again. OK, so overall, well, overall, our merge operations can take place in a single level before it reaches capacity. So that means that each entry gets merged r times in each level. Now we can sum that up across all the different levels, and we get a bound. So here I'm measuring write amplification, the number of times that each entry gets copied on average by merge operations. And that's r times log of n, or r is our size ratio. OK, so now we have a, sort of a full um, I.O. cost breakdown of how the I.O. costs come from across different levels. And that allows us to spot an asymmetry. So the cost of point reads and long range reads mostly come from the largest level. Right? But on the other hand, our writes, our you know, write cost derives equally from across all levels. So that also implies that most of these merge operations that we're doing at smaller levels, they're not doing that much towards helping our point reads and long range reads. Right? So, okay, so perhaps we can, we can be better off by removing these merge operations or doing, doing merge operations at smaller levels more lazily. So, Essentially, the problem is that for point lookups and long range lookups, merging at smaller levels is superfluous. This problem actually gets worse as the data size grows because right, as the data size increases, you have more and more relatively small levels. You're still doing you know, more and more merging at those levels. But for smaller levels, the amount by which these merge operations is helping you to curb point reads or long range reads is exponentially decreasing. So this, is a, this leads to poor performance. And it can also lead to lower device lifetime if you're using an SSD, right? because these merge operations cost writes, and SSDs die as a function of the number of writes that you issue to them. 
So to cope with that problem, we introduced Dostoevsky from Sigma 2018. And that stands for Space-Time Optimized Evolvable Scalable Key Value Store. And relative to existing designs, it's more write optimized. OK, so with Dostoevsky, we essentially introduce a new merge policy to augment the tiered and level design. So, and this policy called lazy leveling is better for mixed workloads. So essentially, what le lazy leveling looks like is it applies the tiered merge policy for all the smaller levels and the leveled greedy merge policy for the largest level. So that implies that for each one of the smaller levels, each one of them is just going to gather runs until it, fills, uh, until it reaches capacity. Only then we're, we're going to do a merge operation. On the other hand, for the largest level, we're going to do a merge operation as soon as a new run comes in to make sure that we still always have at most one run at the largest level. So most of our data is still sorted within one run at the largest level. And now we can do the same I.O. breakdown as before and see what we accomplish by doing this. OK, so for point reads, again, the best way of assigning false positive rates is for them to be exponentially decreasing, which implies that point read cost still comes mostly from the largest level because the false positive rate is there is exponentially higher. Now, a crucial point is to observe that if we were to use uniform false positive rates across all the different levels, we would have a much, much higher expression. Right? So with uniform false positive rates, we would have a log of n coming from the number of levels that we have to, to access, r, which is the number of runs at each one of the levels, times the false positive rate. So the fact that the false positive rates are exponentially decreasing is what allows point reads to essentially shave the log of n factor and the, the O of r factor and just end up with um, e to the power of minus x. Okay, so, so in some sense, this optimization would not make sense if it wasn't for monkey being used. Okay, for long range reads, Okay, so the fact that we have more runs at smaller levels means that range read cost is going to increase. But for long range reads, um, most of the data that we're accessing is still at the largest level. So even though we're introducing some random IOs at smaller levels, um, it's that scan at the largest level that's still going to dominate our scan cost. So um, the largest level still dominates access cost. For short range reads, this is where we really incur sort of the downside of this approach, let's say. Because now we have to access um, O of R runs at each one of the smaller levels and one run at the largest level. So we actually have a worse bound. But for writes, this is where we get our win. Right? So now every entry participates in just one merge operation at each one of the smaller levels, and then in R merge operations at the largest level. So that implies that now we have a bound of r plus log of n. Right? So before we had r times log of n, r plus 1 is significantly lower. Right? OK, so now we have the full analysis for this new scheme. And we can compare it to the level design from before. We observe that for point and long range reads, um, the bounds are the same. For short range reads, the bound for lazy leveling is worse. But for writes, the bound is better. We can also make the same comparison to a tiered LS entry. So for a tiered LS entry, essentially all the, re all the reads are significantly worse, uh, whereas writes are a little bit better because with tiered LS entries, you're, doing, you're not doing these, merging at, these merge operations at the largest level. So you don't have that plus O of R. OK, so now we can map all of these designs again onto the read-write trade-off continuum. And now I'm looking at point reads and writes. And these curves are generated by varying the size ratio for each one of these designs to enumerate all the trade-offs that they enable. And what we observe is essentially that you know, lazy leveling, it has a cheaper write cost than leveling, but the same point read cost, which means that overall the trade-off curve for lazy leveling dominates the trade-off curve for, for, for leveling. Right? On the other hand, if I was to look at short range reads versus writes, in that case, leveling does dominate lazy leveling because you know, it, it merges runs more proactively, so, so short range reads are cheaper. But for larger range reads, uh, the overhead of the range read moves from being random IO at smaller levels to being the scan at the largest level. And in that case, le lazy leveling becomes increasingly more competitive with leveling. Right? Okay, so overall, we have these three designs now. Tiering is good for writes. 
leveling is good for short range reads, and lazy leveling is good for um, in combinations of many writes and point reads in the workload. So then the question is, what, how can we leverage all of these, all these different designs um, and, and be able to choose the best one for a particular workload? So to do that, we introduce um, fluid LSM tree, which is a generalization of, uh, of that design space. And it actually allows you to transition between these different designs in small steps, so essentially to, to be able to assume hybrids between them. And the way it does that is it introduces two parameters, uh, k and z. So k controls the number of runs that you're allowed to have at each one of the smaller levels before the merge is triggered. And z controls the number of runs you're allowed to have at the largest level. OK, and now, OK, so we can set them by default to iron 1, which gives us just a design of lazy leveling. And now, suppose we have different types of operations in the workload, and we, we want to optimize for them differently. Uh, so, so this design now allows us to do that. So suppose we have a workload with many short range reads. OK, so if you want to optimize for them, what we can do is start by uh, decreasing the bound on the number of runs you can have at the smaller levels. And if we do that all the way to 1, we just end up with a level design. Right? So we can just assume a level design to optimize for short range reads if we want to. Suppose we have a lot of writes, and we want to optimize for them. So we can go back to lazy leveling. And now, if we want to optimize even more aggressively, we can start by increasing the bound on the number of runs we have at the largest level. If we get all the way to R, we end up with just a tiered LS entry. Right? So we can assume that if we want to as well. Okay, suppose we have a lot of point reads. Again, we can go back to lazy leveling. We also have the size ratio to be able to tune. And we can increase the size ratio to decrease the proportion of entries at smaller levels. And that's overall going to lead to a lower sum of false positive rates. So that's going to lead to a win in terms of point reads. Right? So now this design allows us to flexibly optimize for any kind of um, workload that we have. All right, so overall, fluid LSM entry has three parameters. And uh, it allows, us to, allows you to assume lazy leveling, tiering, leveling, sort of any hybrid in between. And Dostoevsky is essentially a system built on top that models the types of, that, that models operation costs with respect to these parameters and with respect to the proportion of different operations in the workload and allows you to predict what worst case throughput is going to be and thereby uh, just pick the best design for each, for each workload. Now, there are limitations here. I mean, we're only modeling worst case workloads for now. How to do this more generically for different hardware and for different uh, workload idiosyncrasies like SKU, that's, that's all exciting things that, that we could do in the future. OK, so, so how does all of this perform in practice? So, um, OK, so in this experiment, we're increasing the proportion of point reads in the workload relative to updates. Um, and OK, so the leveling, the leveling merge policy increases in performance as we increase number of reads uh, because it's, it's a read optimized policy. Tiering, on the other hand, degrades in performance as we increase the proportion of, um, of point reads because it's a, it's a more write, write optimized merge policy. Lazy leveling is sort of somewhere in the middle, and it can achieve you know, better balances between, in between. And Dostoevsky essentially dominates all these systems because, by definition, it's a superset of all of these designs. So it can always you know, assume the best point for, for each design. Okay, we can also see how this compares to existing systems. So we compare it to Monkey, a tuned version of RocksDB, and a non-tuned version of RocksDB. Right, so RocksDB in general doesn't perform as well because it actually doesn't contain uh, tiering as a part of its design space, and it doesn't use the Bloom filters optimization. So for that reason, both reads and writes uh, in both ends are more expensive than they, than they need to be. Okay, so we get a win there as well. Yes? So uh, can you tune these parameters during runtime, or is it like a static? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. For now, it's static. Um, I think that being able to do it dynamically at runtime is a, is a super interesting question. Um, the main challenge there is that you know, workloads can change. You can have that situation where you know, the workload is always changing, and you're kind of chasing it. and so how to cope with that problems is, I think, a really important direction to continue pursuing. But for now, I think the main contribution is having a generalization that can actually assume all of these designs, and that can empower um, you know, future efforts to do runtime navigation. And also the cost of changing. 
yeah. structure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any sense on how significant that cost can be? Yeah, so actually it depends. There is an interesting asymmetry that you can exploit. So for example, um, suppose that the proportion of writes is increasing and you want to optimize more for writes. In that case, write adaptation is instantaneous. You just stop merging. Um, on the other hand, if you want to optimize for reads, you actually have to do more work. You have to start merging stuff. Um, so, I mean, it really depends. I mean, you can do it really, really aggressively and just compact everything, which will cost you a lot. Um, or you can do it gradually over time. Um, yeah. Yeah? So where would Pebbles GB uh, kind of uh, fit in this picture? I mean, uh, they are a write-optimized system as well. Are you aware of them? Or, uh, Level DB? Uh, Pebbles DB? Pebbles DB. Um, I am... Yeah, I mean, I've read I've read the paper, but w w is there a particular I thing that you're thinking about? I think they break uh, at each level. They have multiple fragments so, so that they avoid the merging. So probably it fits more like the uh, uh, the tiering approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. So probably what they're doing is they're trying to sort of cluster related data so that they don't have to to try to avoid to maybe try to exploit spatial skew to avoid merging. Yeah. Something like that. yeah. My sense is this would be a complementary approach, and we'll be able to sort of leverage that on top. Yeah. OK, so I, uh, yeah, so just, just, just briefly, so I've presented two papers. I'm just going to say a few words about this new work that we have, and then I'll wrap up. So, OK, so we saw that write cost with uh, lazy leveling is r plus log of n, right? And this implies that as the data size grows, the overhead of uh, writes to smaller levels of the tree increases logarithmically. On the other hand, if we look at point read cost, right, so the false positive rates are decreasing exponentially, right, so, so the reads overhead for smaller levels converge while write overheads for smaller levels still incre continue to increase. And actually, if you look at the memory for the Bloom filters as well, that converges as well, right? So even though we're actually assigning more, relatively more um, bits per entry to smaller levels, the fact that smaller levels still contain exponentially fewer entries like, dominates the linear rate of increase in the number of bits per entry. So overall, both point reads and memory, they converge for smaller levels while write cost continues to increase. So that implies that, okay, so our writes are growing at a rate of log of n, but they're yielding exponentially diminishing returns. Okay, so can we do something about that? So I'm just going to give a hint about what we can do about it, and the rest is in the paper that we've, we've just had accepted on this. Um, so we introduced WACI, uh, which stands for Amorphous Calculable Key Value Store, and it introduces a new data structure called the Log Structured Merge Bush, or LSM Bush. And what LSM Bush does is um, it essentially identifies the, the, the fact that in existing tier designs, you can only have a fixed number of uh, runs in each level, which comes from the fact that the size ratios for the LSM tree are fixed. So the key, the key innovation is, let's say, let allow, let, let's allow smaller levels to gather increasingly more runs. So essentially, we do that by setting them increasing capacity ratios. So for every, for every new smaller level, it, you know, it can gather increasingly more runs relative to the next larger one. And OK. And, Essentially, we show that by using a doubly exponentially increasing uh, number of runs at smaller levels, we can actually get a bound of log log of n, while still maintaining the same memory and point read overhead. The downside is that range reads go to being square root of n. Right? So this is an optimization that's, that's uh, even more suitable for workloads with a lot of writes and point reads, but not so good if you have any range reads in the workload. OK. So now we have all these different designs, and Wacky is essentially a system that generalizes all of them. OK, so in conclusion, so, we've in, so we saw that uh, the modern architecture of key value stores consists of a bunch of Bloom filters and L LSM tree in storage. Um, we introduced Monkey to optimize the allocation of main memory among the Bloom filters to reduce point read cost. Uh, we introduced Dostoevsky to assign uh, or to to perform merge operations more lazily at smaller levels to reduce write cost without having to compromise uh, point read cost. Then we introduce WACI uh, to set increasing capacity ratios for smaller levels and thereby push the trade-off between point reads 
and write and and writes even further. Okay, so essentially, Monkey allows you to stabilize point read cost. Dostoevsky allows you to decrease the rate at which writes degrade, and Wacky allows you to push writes even further. Okay, so overall, we end up with these better scalability properties. Write cost still goes up because. Um, Wacky still only achieves log log of n, right? So it's not it's not constant. All right. So a quick broader insight. So the leveled and tiered designs um, have existed for about twenty years, and in those days we've had relatively little main memory to be able to work with. Um, since then, the amount of main memory in our systems has grown up by a lot, and I think the main sort of broader lesson from this work is that you know by really optimizing what you're doing with your main main memory. There are still asymptotic improvements to, to be gained. Right? So by optimizing main memory, we essentially got an asymptotic improvement for point reads with Monkey, uh, an improvement for writes with Dostoevsky, and then an even greater improvement with, with Wacky. So the key lesson is um, I think that we need to think about these three metrics, um, read cost, write cost, and the amount of main memory. Uh, we need to think about them together. Uh, in particular, given any two of them, uh, so, so given a requirement on any two of the, any two of them, the question is what is the best that you can do with respect to the third one, and that seems to be a still open problem. Like, what is the fundamentally best that you can achieve? So overall, the sort of the broad project is to be able to map all of these different trade-offs, and ultimately to be able to navigate them um, dynamically during runtime for the particular application. Uh, all that is a part of the Crimson DB project, which we have at the lab. And thanks very much for your attention. We have time for some more questions. You didn't say anything about merging the top level of the you know, longest run back into the main data structure. Because I, mean, I can use something like an LSM tree on top of a relatively static structure like a succinct index. And, and um, get some additional search benefits um, I'm from not it. Sure. So I'm not exactly sure that I follow the question. So you say the merging the largest level back into the data structure, which data structure? Well, you've got it. You I mean you basically got an incremental index that mounts to a differential file on top sure. of on top of an index that is static or could be static. You know, so pick pick any one. I mean, it could be say a succinct index which has some nice properties about being able to search in both prefixes and suffixes in interesting ways, which you can't easily search in the layers of your, of your LSM tree. So there's another layer to this story of how often you're going to merge um, from the longest run of the LSM tree back into the static index structure. Um, which is going to give you this richer, this richer set of queries that you can um, execute efficiently compared yeah. to using the kind of index that's available in the LSM tree. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds like 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 a great sort of future track to go on. I mean, do you have? Let me ask you: Do you have a sense of why we cannot actually just apply that succinct index independently to each of the different levels of the LSM tree? Not offhand. I mean, I, yeah. the. the um, I mean, these static index structures are quite different than simply uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're using relatively simple search structuring on these on these layers of the LSM tree. I don't know what it would look like if you were doing some of these clever encodings that are that are used for some of these other data structures. Yeah, yeah. So the question, I suppose, is um, how ex expensive it would be to merge two succinct data structures. Um, to be able to use it in this context. Yeah, I just wonder whether it just changes somehow, it just changes the trade-offs. So, anyway, it's, I mean, it's a rhetorical question. Yeah. I understand it's, yeah. it's out of scope, but yeah. it yeah. seems like a natural. Because I mean, you're improving the you're improving the read-write behavior. And one of the problems with these sorts of, of other indexes is they're highly static. That that they're really not designed for updates at all. Um, I mean, you, the only hope is to rebuild them. Right. And so. You've got this um, update, um, this, this, this layered approach to being able to handle the updates efficiently, but still at the bottom, at some point, you're going to have to bite the bullet and rebuild. 
you know, if you've got the incremental index becomes large enough relative to the very efficient statically built index. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, something to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's interesting. I mean, for one thing, I suppose that whenever we're actually merging two runs on the go, we could create a succinct data structure for them, right? I mean, the succinct data structure will presumably be smaller relative to the size of the raw data, right? That's the entire point. So given that the merge operation is dominated by I.O. costs to storage, um, the fact that we would only have to build that succinct data structure in memory might mean that actually building that succinct data structure in memory can come for free while we're doing the merge operation. And then you can have essentially an LSM tree in memory of succinct data structures, each one of them corresponding to, to one of the rounds. I mean, that's just an offhand thought, but maybe something like that could be possible. Yeah, but I would need to look more closely at that problem. Thanks. Uh, so I noticed that you don't have CPU as part of this uh, picture. Yeah. So uh, CPU costs might also start becoming important. For yeah. example, if you're, say, uh, it's just a bunch of point reads and uh, you're, uh, uh, instead of going through this heavyweight loom filter, you may have a faster access method that you may be able to use. And there may be caching going on as well, which would stress the CPU more. Yeah. So have you, do you have thoughts on that? Totally, why? totally. That's, that's a wonderful point. So, so you're completely right. So. As I said, with the new design of, of LSM Bush, um, there are actually square root of n runs in the system. That's a lot of runs, right? So in the worst case, you actually have to check square root of n bloom filters. And that can be a CPU bottleneck. Um, actually, we do address that in a new paper. So we propose an approach whereby smaller levels. So, so the nice thing, LSM Bush gives us an opportunity to really optimize for that problem, because most of the runs in the system are actually at level 1. But level one contains a very small fraction of the overall data. So essentially what we're doing is we're replacing the bloom filters at smaller levels by hash tables, actually just like the ones that you're using at faster or similarly. And the, the idea is that they contain key signatures. And overall, the key signature size that we're assigning to a particular level, we set that to be equal to the expected sum of false positives that we would have had from that level anyways. Okay, so we get a modest memory amplification, but it doesn't really matter because these smaller levels are so much smaller, so they contain much less data, and the false positive rates stay the same. So actually, it's, it's like a series of hash tables that kind of converge into sort of a, an LSM tree. Yeah. So today, mostly on LSM tree and some variants. Yeah. Can you sort of comment broadly on, say, VW tree and its variants? What is LSM tree? Like, what do you see? Yeah, like yeah. So, yeah, actually, I would be really interested to speak to people here about BW tree. Um, so, well, as far as I understand, BW tree is really good for concurrency, uh, and that's one of the main design motivations. So, um, and as far as I understand, BW tree is also the main application is memory rather than storage. I'm not sure I could be corrected on that, but. Um, we do have storage. So it is kind of the primary you know, right, right, right. The llama storage system that they have. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to sort of bring up discussion, one, one sort of performance problem that I see with respect to handling writes with BW tree is that okay. So right, BW tree is similar to an LSM tree in the sense that you're buffering a bunch of insertions and then putting them in one physical node. So new, new updates go into like a single physical unit. And then you have a mapping from a logical node to multiple to the multiple physical nodes that span all the logical data in that node. The performance problem that I see is that in order to do a write, you have to first of all traverse the logical structure of the BW tree to find out to which logical node it should belong to. That seems expensive. And only once you know the logical node that it belongs to, only then can you actually insert it into the buffer. LSM tree actually avoids that problem, but just you don't have to do that initial search by just putting the entry in the buffer. So um, I think the thing that I'm, I'm wondering about BW tree is actually how it avoids that problem, and if it solves that problem, like exactly how it does that. So, yeah. It's pretty much a hash table between the logical and the physical, and it's completely stored in memory. So it's just a order of one lookup without any logs or anything. So you're saying that like with a single hash table probe, I can figure out what the logical yeah. Notice. Yeah. And, um, okay. And for and if you support partial updates, which we do in BWG, uh -huh. uh, then it's just a, uh, uh, you know, with the help of a stub, we don't need to uh, do a retry or to bring the page into the memory from this. Okay. We just do an in memory update, a partial update, and we're done. 
Okay. Right, but you still need to traverse the bit tree. The bit tree. What they don't need to. Only on the blind updates. But we managed to keep the levels on the bit tree pretty less, which is less than three, four, five, not more than that, even for a large size of 50 GB of logical address space. So do you have to, so is it, so when you're doing a write and you're trying to find out the, the logical node, are you doing like, uh, are, you, are you actually doing like a logical tree traversal or, you, yeah, or is that so a single the, operation? So the logical tree nodes are just pointers to the logical page IDs. So once we know which logical page ID we need to modify, yeah, yeah, yeah. we just do one lookup on the hash table to figure out where is the physical pointer to the page right now. And how expensive is it exactly to figure out what is the logical node ID? Uh, that's an order of login in, in terms okay. of uh, the tree traversal. Yeah. And, and is that mostly memory or is that in the, the, Yeah, we keep the index pages in memory. Yeah. Only the leaf level data pages can be swapped out for this yeah. Yeah, on yeah. memory question. Okay. So finding the leaf level data page to go up into, yeah. that is completely in memory. Okay. And finding the logical to physical once you reach the leaf level, yeah. that's also a order of one lookup in the hash table. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I'd be really interested to talk more about this and like to ask particularly like where you found like the bottlenecks in that solution and to be able to compare and contrast. So yeah. I think well, one of the extensions possibly that I'm looking for in these stores is how do you plan to handle partial updates? So uh, what exactly do you mean by partial updates? So uh, you have a key, you have a value, mm -hmm. and the next time you want to change it, you don't give a full update to it. Ah, yeah. yeah you yeah. just want to do a partial change. Yeah. And the reads are expected to consolidate. So let's say uh, an incrementation. No read before write. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, um, so that's, that's... So, I mean, in some sense, LS entry allows you to do that very naturally by just yeah. storing, an, like, uh, you know, the operator and operand and then to consolidate or merge operations essentially for free. Um, the problem is that uh, it's an open question like how generically you can handle that, right? So, you know, you can have arbitrarily complex logic in terms of how you do the consolidation process. And then the question is how to like embed that logic within like the LSM entry to, to know how to do the merge. Um, I mean, I don't know if that answers the question yeah, or whether so there's more. In general, what we have seen is like uh, you need to store some kind of back equivalent of back pointers uh, to all the previous uh, chain for the same key. And uh, those could be at different levels if we were to do it on top of an LSM tree. So one levels, com if you just do one levels compaction, for example, then it is possible that only if uh, some part of the chain of a particular logical key is in that level. But you cannot independently kind of move them. You have to update the back pointers of the fragments which are present in the other levels as well. So if I can just interject for a second. So maybe we can end that off now and we can have some discussions on So it sounds like an interesting topic yeah. to yeah. discuss here. Uh, but let's thank Nepal right. one more time. Thank you. Thank you.